Welcome to the Community Green Committee meeting um, this um, January 17th, 2024. We have uh, as our guest um, X Randy Wade with the um, Food and Water Watch. And, and Clean Water Action. Clean Water Action, sorry. Um, so before we begin, uh, a couple uh, quick uh, announcements. First of all, um, we are scheduled to uh, uh, end this at about 8.30. Um, so there should be plenty of time for questions and things afterwards. The uh, I'd like to call your attention that uh, uh, Sustainable Jersey Cities um, has a program, certificate program, covering uh, main, some of the main issues in uh, um, sustainability, uh, so systems thinking in terms of environment, uh, environmental justice issues, uh, broadly speaking. Um, so that includes not only the environment, uh, the, 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 but itself, but also economics and also the um, people. So, uh, and it, then we, we will go on and talk about emissions. We'll talk about waste streams and we'll talk about um, urban ecology. So you are all invited to, to uh, sign up for that. Uh, the cost is relatively minimal. It's been going on for a number of years with, with a lot of positive feedback. So if you have questions on, on that, um, please be feel to address, address either Ash or myself at the end of this. Uh, but it's certainly something that um, gives a good broad background to these issues. Um, okay. With that. And just, just, just before you go on, David. Go so to be clear, you folks are already in the game. <laughs> So whether you take the certificate or not, you have friends and people that you work with who might benefit. These are the five modules, as you can see them on the shared screen, right? So we're going to talk about sustainability and systems thinking, uh, environmental justice, uh, emissions, uh, broadly speaking emissions, greenhouse gases, and so on and so forth. Climate change also comes into that. Uh, sustainability in practice, making it real. How do you do this stuff? right, on an everyday basis. It's nice to talk about, but in a city, how do you actually implement sustainability? Uh, that's There's gonna be a present two presentations on that, and then waste streams, right? Uh, we're going to look at um, the, the, the whole gamut. Uh, so we all know that reduce, reuse, recycle was the mantra, and we focused on re, re, uh, re, uh, recycle because it seemed to be the easy way and forgot about the others. Uh, and we don't recycle very well either. So we're going to look at the whole supply chain issue and uh, where waste comes from and what we can do in that process to begin to re reduce the amount of stuff. There's an argument that can be made. If you think climate change is a serious problem, then I will tell you right now, that it is not the disease. It is the symptom of the disease. The disease is overshoot. We're using too much stuff from the planet. That's what's causing all these problems. The, the, the sort of what they call the poly crisis, if you've ever heard that expression. It's not just climate change. There's a whole bunch of other things that are coming to a head as well. And they refer to it as a poly crisis. So, it, it's getting at the root of things. Donella Meadows used to say, go upstream before you try to act. Mm -hmm. Go as far upstream as you can and then do what you need to do. It has the maximum system effect. All right, David, back to you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to add to that one other item. In, in, in practice, when we, we do what we do in these areas, um, out of necessity, we, we tackle a small piece of the pie. No one person can do it all. But it also means that you, to be effective, you need to be able to listen and talk to people that are doing different slices of the pie. And so this is an effort to not get super detailed in any one slice, but to give a broad enough picture that you can start dialogues with people that are doing other work that impacts the work that you're doing. So it's a starting place. Um, or what, what I might say is it's it's giving you a license to learn. 
And when does this program start? Is this going to be emailed around? Or I'm definitely interested in, I just don't know. Okay. So it's it going to be well. every Tuesday evening, starting March 12th, okay. uh, every Tuesday for 10, 10 sessions. Online, of course. Yeah. Okay, and there's a way, if I go on to Ramapo College, I can No, no, no not Ramapo College. No, no, not Ramapo College. Let me give you the link in the chat. Um, okay. One second. Okay, thanks. Link address and link. So if you go to the first link that I'm putting in there, you will come to the page for... Um, Sorry, you'll come to the page for um, stop sharing. I can't. I can't use chat while I'm sharing. Uh, <laughs> you'll come to the page for the 2023 uh, certificate. It hasn't been updated yet. The second link is to the prospectus for the current certificate. So this is for the. Um, this gives you an overview, registration page, all the rest of that. And then there's okay. um, the prospectus itself with the real details of what's going to happen. It's there. Uh, prospectus as you said again. There we go. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Yep. Back to okay. you, David. Okay. With that, why don't we, um, since I, I certainly don't know everybody here, why don't we give a very brief introduction about say, who you are, why you're here, um, et cetera. Just keep it brief so we can put something besides a face and a name into things. And um, I'll go first. I'm Dave Larrabee. Um, I'm a board member of SJC and one of the instructors in the certificate program. Uh, I worked as a physicist for a number of years in various aspects, but most of my work has actually been on, all around religion and environment, uh, religion, science and religion dialogue around environmental issues. Um, of course, climate change takes most of the air out of the room, but there's certainly a lot of other issues than that. Um, and what I'll do is I'll call, I'll call the next person so we get it. So why don't um, we go to Amanda? Hello, um, I'm Amanda Richards. So I'm the Northern Regional Coordinator for Working Well. Uh, this is an initiative under Tobacco Free for a Healthy New Jersey, which is funded by the Department of Health. Um, we are gearing up for our summer initiative, which is called Breathe Easy Al Fresco, uh, where we focus on promoting um, smoke-free outdoor dining. And because Jersey City is a part of Sustainable Jersey, that's kind of how we're trying to connect with everybody. So um, this is my first meeting that I've been to. I'm just kind of here to see what it's about and see if um, I can work with Sustainable Jersey in the future. So, thank you. The short answer, of course, is yes, you can. But we'll <laughs> awesome. find out more. So, maybe I want you to pick somebody else to go. Um, how about Melissa? Sure, thanks. Yes, my name's Melissa Hotchkiss. I live in Jersey City, right near Lincoln Park on the west side. And I'm part of the Lincoln Park North Neighborhood Association on the green team that we just established. And um, so I also was, I also participated in a, an event with Sustainable JC last year with trees um, over by Arlington Park. So just have a big personal interest in all of this and want to get more involved. Okay, point to somebody else. Sure, Nathaniel. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Nathaniel or Nathan. I live in uh, Journal Square area. I got connected with Sustainable Jersey City through um, the uh, Jersey City Together organization. Uh, it's like an interfaith uh, community activism organization, and uh, we're interested in getting more involved with sustainable activities within Jersey City. Uh, happy to be here. 
Uh, and um, I'd like to hear from X, Lacey and Cole. Hello, thank you um, for passing it to me, uh, Nathan. Um, hi, my name is X. Um, I'm the environmental justice organizer for Clean Water Action. Um, I have a lot of background in community organizing, um, direct action organizing, and I just started this role in June. Um, yeah, I got involved with Sustainable Jersey City because as an organizer, I have certain zones I'm like required to I guess, uh, look at in terms of their environmental landscape. So Jersey City, and I'll get into this, is an overburn community. And I work in five overburn communities, Jersey City, Newark, Camden, and um, Elizabeth and Patterson. So um, yeah, they happen to be uh, having a permit here and coming up. And I you know, contacted Deb um, to see how we can partner um, in Jersey City. Thank you. Um, how about Devin? You hey, already X. Went. How about you already? No, went. I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't go. No. Okay, because um, I saw your camera on. I thought you were talking. Go ahead. No, no, it's all good. Um, hopefully you guys can see me. No, no. Yes, we New can. City cab. Okay. <laughs> um, nice to meet you all. I um. I am an ESG or environmental, social, and corporate governance uh, strategist with an investment firm um, called Harding Lovner. We are based in uh, Bridgewater, New Jersey, and I work on the really the nexus of financial services and sustainability, and uh, and the the work of our firm is investing in. Uh, public stocks globally, um, specifically working on a uh, fund that is aligned with the Paris Agreement and focused on climate. Um, so, and uh, I met Deb this summer. Um, I ran in uh, one of the races that SJC sponsored in Lincoln Park um, and I met Deb after that. So was interested to get involved um, I live in uh, Hamilton Park um, for the last couple of years, my wife and I. So great to meet uh, all of you and uh, definitely interested in that certificate as well. So maybe I'll pass it to Mithu. Mithu, you there? Oh, yeah, sorry. Couldn't find my mute button. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mithu. I am um, the events team lead for SJC. So, Amanda, maybe we can chat. Um, <laughs> and I also live, Melissa, like right by you. I'm also um, right by Lincoln Park on the west side, too. Um, yeah, Hi, just, Jake. you know, here to listen in. I'm really interested to learn more about everything that's happening um, with Liberty State Park. So definitely uh, excited. And who's left to call on? Um, Ashwini, did you go? I don't think no, so, I right? have not. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Of course. I'll go next. Um, so my name is Ashwini Vasisht. Uh, most people do call me Ash. And in my defense, it is not an Americanization. It's what else called in India, where I grew up. Uh, I trained in Russia as an architect, became a planner, and then started doing sustainability. And I've been doing sustainability for about 20, 30 years in various forms. Uh, I'm a professor of sustainability at Ramapo College. I do not live in Jersey City. I'm an interloper. But... Uh, I've been connected to Jersey City since I came to New Jersey in 2009. I looked around for a city where I could do urban ecology kinds of things, which is what I used to do in Los Angeles. I lived there for 18 years uh, and found Jersey City. And as soon as I found Jersey City, uh, chance would have it. Deborah came into uh, Rambo College to make a presentation about something. We connected. We talked the same language. And we started doing stuff in Jersey City. 
After about two projects, we realized that there were a lot of organizations in Jersey City, but none that looked at the entire city and none that looked at sustainability as a systems approach. So we said, that's what we need to do. And Sustainable Jersey City is where we are. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Neka. Uh, how do you say your name? How are you? You might be muted. No sound. No, it's just static. No, no action. Uh, there is a log. There's a way of doing it by phone, right? How about now? Uh, can you hear? Can you? Oh, can you hear me now? Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay, good. Oh, excellent, excellent. Hi, everyone. My name is Nika Pyle. Uh, I recently just joined JDC. Um, also. Uh, its affiliate is DCO as their community outreach coordinator for the competitive. Tell us, tell us what the tell us what the acronyms mean. JDC, uh, they are acronyms to my knowledge. They're the three, uh, the the president, CEO, and the COO names combined. But basically, we. Um, our construction management company and we go in and do energy conservation efforts within the community, whether that be a school district, a municipality, or um, any affiliates in that that line within the commu uh, community or state uh, legislative, legislative. I only started about a month ago. So a little bit of the jargon's a little new. I feel like there's a bunch of newbies on this call, so I feel really, uh, I, I, I feel like- At home. Do at, at home. Feel at home. Do home. Thank you. It's been a long day. Yes, I feel at home. But my, uh, my portion to JDC and DCO is to promote their competitive edge program, which enriches enrich the students of Jersey City currently because we just uh, did a really big deal with them and we are going in and changing out all of things from lighting fixtures to boilers to uh, air ducts to make it more energy friendly and that is in part of Governor Murphy's initiative for the green plan, I believe. Okay. Like so where, where is this energy work going on? In K through 12 schools or in the city? Uh, it's going on in 40, the 44 schools in Jersey City currently. Um, that is what we're contracted to do. So we're changing out the lighting fixtures with green tech. We have solar landscape as uh, another entity putting in um, different solar panels throughout the different uh, schools. Some are getting uh, boilers, some are getting new windows. So our, our job is really to bring down the cost and make it more energy friendly throughout the community. Excellent. That's my understanding. That's yeah. a nice understanding. Do you have a website you can point us at? Uh, yes, absolutely. I'll put it in the chat. And yeah. we have an initiative rolling out this spring with the K through 12 uh, students in Jersey City, where we are going to run programs on 
uh, STEM and STEAM to promote more engineering and construction in the underserved communities of Jersey City. So that's my spiel so far. I Thank had a you. better spiel, good. but I kind of went off script. So no, yeah, it's good. You did well. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, well, I, I'm sorry. Did, me too. Me too. Did you go? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So my fault. I have a memory problem. Go ahead. Back to you, David. <laughs> That's why I write it down. <laughs> so let's let's turn the, the thing over to our guest speaker tonight, uh, X, and reintroduce yourself. And the floor is yours. Thank you. I appreciate that. So let me share my screen first. Hold on. Um, Okay. Can you guys see this good? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. You guys aren't like a side like image, right? Because uh, I have the no, but, but is this a PDF? No, oh, it's not. Put okay. up, the put it top of, top and bottom maybe cut out. Cut off. Yeah, I'm gonna put it in present mode. Ah is okay. All right. Yeah, there you go. Good, good, good. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, I guess I can give my extensive or like drawn out um, introduction. Hello, my name is X. Um, again, I'm the EJ organizer for Clean Water. Um, and my background is primarily in organizing. Um, in college, I majored in community and justice studies. And I got to, you know, work with different types of communities, refugee and immigrant students, um, you know, obviously low income students. I went to school in um, at Guilford College in North Carolina. Um, what else? Yeah, and I've been, I'm from Newark first and foremost. And uh, I've been, my first organization, I guess, role was with the Newark Students Union. Um, and I appreciate that because our uh, goal uh, was local control of our schools, of our public schools, because since the 90s, they've been controlled by, um, I guess, the state system in Trenton, which leads to a lot of inequities on how, how resources are distributed. For example, like Science Park, the school I went to was the best North Public High School. So we got, you know, we have a pool, we have resources that get updated every, every year, but there are schools like Shabazz High School that barely get books every five years right so we were trying to change that and luckily in 2019 when I was a senior we got that so that kind of bolstered my um, passion for social justice because I know you know community community engagement works definitely works so yeah Oh, and also I want to say, feel free to ask me questions, um, you know, in between slides, during slides. This is a lot of information and I know um, you guys have a lot of different backgrounds, uh, so it might be completely new to you. So please feel free to, you know, have me explain something or ask me a question about something you have confusion on or even give a comment because this stuff is interesting and honestly I don't have a lot of people to talk to about it <laughs> because um I honestly just found out about uh the issue in November and the permit hearing didn't come up until December so it, it's been a really quick turnaround in terms of getting people to rally around it but now let me introduce the issue so um this uh, presentation is going to be about a group called Diversified Global Graphics Group um, because they have a permit hearing coming up or a permit renewal coming up. So right now um, the facility is in Jersey City and they have a lot of effects on not only the community around them, but like the Jersey City as a whole as an overburden community. And I'll explain that more. So yeah, we're gonna go to the introduction, which is what I did. The DG3 um, group itself and notice the health impacts, uh, the EJ law, which I um, am, I guess, you formatting my work under because overburdened communities are defined by the environmental justice law. Um, there are certain criteria, which I'm going to go over later. Um, Jersey City, what that looks like specifically there. Um, their renewal. The EJ law and a law very similar to that, the administrative order, who which 
predates the EJ law. So um, the environmental justice law is like one of the most progressive um, laws about, uh, I guess, environmental justice out right now in the country. But before that, they had to implement like kind of a test version where things are more so required. I mean, more so suggested than required. So the EJ law, I'll get into this, but I just wanted to let you know that administrative order is basically the EJ law before it was the EJ law. Um, the public hearing, which is a part of the permit process, um, what we can do and summarizing all this because it's a lot. Okay, so why I, am I, you know, interested in this issue and how did I find it? Um, so as an environmental justice organizer, I go, you know, regularly on the Department of Environmental Protections page to like check out, you know, anything related to overburden communities. And that's specifically in the environmental justice section. So because of the EJ law or the environmental justice law, um, facilities that are major sources or emit a lot of pollution, they're required to do certain things. They have a certain amount. They have certain steps they have to take before they can be renewed. And one of them is participating with the community. So yeah, Diversify Global Graphics Group, um, it's at 100 Burma Road in Jersey City. If you guys know where that is, I'm gonna be showing pictures uh, a little bit later. Um, they're renewing their Title V air permit. So a Title V permit basically is uh, any, is uh, given under to any person or any facility that emits a certain amount, over a certain amount of, you know, pollution a year. So any Title V is already a significant source of pollution. So again, it's located in an overburdened community and um, the notice itself of public hearing also has a public comment period attached to it. Uh, the notice was published, so it opened the 60 day comment period. Um, and I will say this, a problem with that is it opened the comment period, but it never had an opening date, right? There's never any date that it was actually published. So nobody knows when the 60 days ended or started. Um, and I'm in direct communication with the director of environmental justice at the DEP, and she couldn't give me an explanation as to why that happened. She was like, hmm, that's weird. I'll get back to you, you know? So she was able to find the date itself, but the fact that it wasn't you know, published is a problem because that deters people from, you know, even making a comment. They don't know if it'll count or not. So yeah, um, the thing about both laws, the administrative order and the EJ law, and I mentioned the administrative order because that's the, the law that DG3 is functioning under. So just keep in mind that most of the things that they have to engage in are um, suggestions. So there are certain things that they have to do, like they have to hold at least one meeting and this is a part of what they have to do. So they have to uh, respond to every written comment on record. Um, they also have to have a public information session, like I said, um, but the web link apparently had to be you know, sent three or requested at least three days in advance for you to actually join the meeting. Right. So that decreases accessibility in itself, because even if that's not the case, because I asked him, I me and Christian are like this now. We're not like this. We're more like like this now because we don't we don't we don't mix. But we're pretty close to each other. I asked him if I can share the link. And he said, oh, well, there's nothing that prevents you from not sharing it. What's that supposed to mean? You know, and, and, and that's not even in the notice. It didn't say that people can share it. That's why I'm asking you. So that in itself is a problem. Um, I'll note because, so I gave the first version of this presentation before the meeting, a couple of days before. Um, it's obviously after December 6th. Only me and one other person came up, uh, came, showed up for the meeting. It was me and uh, Doug O'Malley from uh, Earth Justice. Um, he's a lawyer there and he was a part of my webinar and like, you know, appreciated what I was doing. And it was only me and him there because I only found out about this three weeks ago and the community basically didn't know. 
Um, yeah, so this is the exact text of their permit of the public notice. So DG3, what is it? It's a it's basically a paper company that you know uses that prints paper and other products at you know a huge rate. Apparently they print billions of pieces of paper a day. And um, that makes them a major source for volatile organic compounds and an area source for hazardous air pollutants. Um, the cleaning solvents, the inks they use, all of them uh, contribute and are significant sources of these VOCs and HAPs. So um, that's what they chose to include in the permit. But obviously as an environmental justice organizer, one of my jobs is to do deep research into what they're actually doing. And I discovered a whole lot. Um, let's get into it. So just to go over it, if people don't know, which I'm guessing you guys don't, because uh, this I had to learn this all from scratch too. Um, so volatile organic compounds or VOCs are organic compounds that can basically evaporate easily at room temperature. So you can smell it, you know, it might have a, an, a strong odor, but you can't see it at room temp temperature. And um, they can come from various sources, like, you know, industrial processes, 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 um, vehicle emissions, et cetera. Um, and they all contribute to air pollution. Now, hazardous air pollutants are another group, and they're a group of air pollutants that cause or are suspected to cause, you know, adverse effects. Um, they, ca they can be called air toxic sometimes, and they include benzene, mercury, formaldehyde, uh, and they're regulated by agencies, um, by the DEP. So there are specific limits that they have to have for each individual chemical. And there are also certain limits they have to have for a group of chemical chemicals, which makes uh which defines how DG3 is classified. So DG3 said that they are a major source of VOCs, meaning that they um the amount of toxins they emit uh either exceed are a hundred tons per year total or exceed 10 tons per year of a half. Um, the area source is a small concentrated number of toxins, so they have to emit less than 10 tons a year of any toxin um, and less than 25 of any combined toxin. So uh, they, you, from that, you can see or you can just sum it up to they make a lot of VOCs and they make a lesser amount of HAPs. Um, yeah. So this is the EJ law, the one I kept referring to and not explaining. Um, the EJ law was passed in 2021 and it specifically addresses like health concerns on communities that face, you know, the impacts of climate change and pollution the most. Um, and in this, honestly, I would describe the, the law itself, it's about 50 pages. I would describe it as, you know, first and foremost, an apology letter. Like the whole first part is like, we understand that we wronged you guys. Like these are words specifically from the law. I didn't change anything. It says it is past time for the state to correct their historical injustice, right? And then it says, this is all from the law. It says facilities in overburdened communities have residents that suffer from increased health effects, including asthma, cancer, elevated blood levels, cardiovascular disease, and developmental disorders, right? Children, in the law, it says children are especially vulnerable and may severely limit a child's success. So they sat there and they did research and they were like, oh my goodness, these kids in these areas have very low life chances. And we gotta do something about that, right? So this law is openly you know, admitting that we have problems and there are a disproportionate amount of burdens on overburdened communities and it's trying to fix that. And what my job is, is to basically advocate for that fixing and help the community understand how they can fix it. Um, like presentations like this. Um, yeah, so an overburdened community is a specified 
or specific term. It's any census block group, uh, according to the census, where at least 35% qualify as low income, at least 40% identify as minorities or members of a state recognized tribe, and or, sorry, and or, at least 40% of the households have limited English proficiency. And this is the map from the DEP. Um, as you can see, they were not lying when they come when it comes to the disproportionate, you know, amounts of benefits and burdens. Um, this whole area where Jersey City, Newark, et cetera, is, is the very much low income and also where pollution is adjacent to. Um, and all of these other blue places as well. But you can see that there are some places that don't have any. And they also, you know, give the statistics of that too. Not in the law itself, but like in the programming information um, and the things they put out in addition to the law. So like the EJ map, where you can see specifically your area's uh, air quality uh, and toxin, uh, what is it called? Particles of uh, ca cancer toxins, like you can see everything on there. So what I found out from that data is that Jersey City has 190 Black groups that are overburdening. So that's any combination of these, you know, uh, I guess, qualifications at any given time. Um, X, other, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, in, in this statement that you made, the Sussex, Hunterdon, and Warren having a lower uh, incidence of uh, emissions. Have you mm -hmm. looked at land use in those counties? Are many of these counties actually preserved land or something like that? Or do they have I... cities in them? Because Jer Jersey City is the second largest city in New Jersey. And if it did not have overburdened communities, I would be so surprised as a planner. Uh, that's where manufacturing is. That's where all yeah, these activities are. Right. And that's what, you know, the law is saying that that's what they're trying to control right now. And they're trying to push facilities out of those, those communities or at least lower emissions, um, you know, enough for where it has a very minimal impact on them. So like evening out, you know, the playing field for who does or doesn't get sick, you know. Uh, Deb calls, you know, that section, uh, the middle section of Jersey City asthma alley, right? That shouldn't be a thing if it's caused, if it's true that it's caused by facilities, right? That's kind of the same thing as like Nork having an incinera incinerator in the Ironbound. It always stinks in Nork. It does, but it's the it's the incinerator. We didn't ask for an incinerator. Incinerator that doesn't benefit us. I'm I don't you know, but all of our trash gets sent there in our community. Why can't they choose one of these other non-occupied, oh, non-occupied spots? And that's what the law is addressing. There were other places that these places, these facilities could have chosen, but, you know, it was cheaper. It was, people wouldn't notice because these are people that are already uh, disadvantaged. And, you know, it's convenient to do it there. The land is convenient. Um, so yeah, yeah. And I definitely wanna compare this data to um, uh, what we see specifically with DG3 and how, where they're located. Um, yeah, so just a little bit more detail into Jersey City. Um, lead is very pervasive throughout Jersey City, but apparently Jersey City has one of the highest rates of children with ele elevated blood lead levels. Um, exposure is very long lasting and children who observe, absorb like even trace amounts um, have a long, you know, lead can suffer for a long time after, you know, it's in their system. There is actually a very, very, very low amount that or low threshold uh, for the amount of lead that should be in your blood, like very th slow, very very slim chances of like not having, you know, any lifelong effects after you reach that level. So um, that 
is also in conjunction with them having extreme heat. Sorry, I have to move this all the way to see the screen. Hold on. Okay. Um, yeah, that is also with um, extreme heat that worsens air quality. Um, this is actually something I learned from Sustainable Jersey City Dev herself. Uh, you know, they did a project on creating, um, they did a project around urban heat islands and researching Jersey City as one. Um, and apparently, you know, through their research, there's too many dark surfaces and not enough trees. So that's what creates the conditions to worsen air quality in Jersey City. Um, and when air quality is worse, in addition to, you know, the last bullet, Jersey City having the highest rate of adult asthma in H Hudson County, um, that even further, you know, I guess, adds to the health issues that those people experience. So like more hospitalizations, you know, long lasting asthma instead of short term, um, et cetera. Yeah, so I just wanted to take a look at specifically the low income portion of Jersey City, um, 90,000 residents live twice below the poverty line. Um, about 50% are African-American and Hispanic. And most of the things that, um, most of the qualifications that Jersey City meets as an overburdened community have to do with low income and minority or minority communities. Um, yeah, and DG3 has, a revenue of $68 million yet. And the estimated revenue of their employees is about $160,000, meaning that they operate right next to the communities that live twice below the poverty line, right? And that's another critique that the EJ law is making, that they also have the resources to make these, these people have better quality of life and they just have to, you know, enforce or you know put a law in place to make them do so um yeah so i just wanted a little bit of context uh to give you guys a little bit of context as to where it is specifically um this is the address and with the new zoning that jersey city has went through it's in ward e uh which is james solomon's uh ward um, I just wanted to, well, we might go back to this, but I just wanted to do, actually, I talked about this, Ash, a little background as to why the EJ law is important, um, especially when facilities like that exist in Jersey City. Um, the first one just is like the community should be involved in decision making. Um, that's something that the EJ law critiques, the fact that these places just sneak up on them oh, when did that get there, right? We didn't say that we wanted that. Why is that next to my daughter's school, et cetera? Um, just giving them, uh, a, giving them a chance to participate in the decision-making process. And then access to information. Um, now they have to submit and facilities have to submit and make public um, environmental uh impact statements, so how they impact the environment around them. Um, like I said, equitable distribution of benefits and burdens. Um, they want, this law basically wants to, um, like I said, prevent disproportionate burdens of pollution. So it promotes like an equitable uh, distribution of both benefits and burdens. So eventually they're going to, well, Eventually, it might look like these facilities moving out of those communities, but also it can look like them giving back to those communities, um, which I'll talk to talk talk about a little bit later on. Um, yeah, so these are reasons that I talked about, you know, health disparities, lack of political power, economic disparities and zoning. Um, these are all reasons why, you know, it's it. New Jersey has recognized it's been unfair for people of color and in overburdened communities to live in these conditions. Uh, yeah, so the administrative order, like I said, um, is not more so requirements uh, than suggestions. There's a 60 day comment period, a 30 day comment period, and uh, a public notice. 
not as comprehensive. And what I mean by that is in the EJ law, you have to uh, you have to post it in Spanish and in English and in the language that uh, the community speaks, so Spanish, English. And if they speak mostly, you know, Portuguese, you have to do it in that too, um, depending on the census statistics that they give out. Uh, you have to do it in at least two newspapers. You have to include a map of the facility. None of that is required in the administrative order. Um, all they did was post a paragraph uh, about how they make paper and paper products and their major sources. Uh, so like I said, not as comprehensive at all. And they have to address, like I said, every public comment from they receive from the community. Um, I'll also say... I say yeah I I don't mention it here but I also say that um the Department of Environmental Protection cannot make a decision about the permit until 45 days after the comment period ends so I asked for an extension of the comment period and now it ends on February 4th um which is not that long away not that far away and we're going to talk about that um and yeah, they have 45 days to do so. So yeah, uh, one thing I will say again about the administrative order versus the EJ law. In the EJ law, the DEP can deny permits based on public, um, they can deny new permits based on like public census or what they feel like, you know, would be best for the community. In the administrative order, it's kind of automatically approved. Um, and because that's how it was before, uh, and they they didn't uh, apply under the EJ law. They actually <sighs> submitted their application 19 days before the EJ law was passed. So, yeah, what I what I want to say by that is that um, while the DEP can't deny their permit completely, they can put conditions on their permit based on what we you know say that we want and they have to take that in, into consideration an important part of the administrative order though is one of the last sections um where it says uh where permits or approvals may be issued apply you know you know, apply such special conditions as may be necessary to avoid or minimize environmental or public health stressors. That's what I just said. But um, this is something that's really important to the public comment period that's ending on February 4th. Nothing in this order shall in any way limit the department's authority to reopen or further extend any public comment period on a case-by-case -case basis with uh, consistent with apl applicable statutes and regulations. Um, that's very important because that means that even though uh, DG3 can only give us a 30 day uh, extension, the DEP, if they, you know, if we find, you know, the inconsistencies egregious enough, they can give us an extension um, on behalf of them. So I talked a lot about how bad these these people are in this place is, but I didn't really tell y'all who these people are and what this place is. So from the DG3 website, again, Diversify Global Graphics Group, it's a tech industry paper, you know, a, a paper business that um, has a variety of services. So they do printing, they do advisory, um, I guess advising on, you know, marketing, et cetera, compliance, uh, digital marketing, and it, marketing and dist uh, distribution. Um, I forgot to say it, but uh, the person you're actually supposed to submit public comments to uh, has been outsourced by Compliance Place International. Um, he's the vice president of Compliance Place International. And um, yeah, they, they don't take questions directly. You have to go through Compliance Place International. So this is what it looks like. Looks like maybe a BMD, a BMW store, you know, maybe an office building. But this is what it looks like, very unsuspecting. This is what it actually is, right? It's a mini factory, if you want to call it so, if you can call that mini, but it's a factory essentially. So you see people working with gloves, a lot of paper, et cetera. Um, and this, 
these are the type of machines that they use in VG3. Uh, and that's important because I guess I'll talk about it more later, but it's important because this is one of the machines that they installed without an operating permit. That is kind of the big, I guess, wow, this is not good for the community. Um, they have over 20 violations from the DEP, um, and a lot of them include air pollution, right? They're, they're exceeding their emissions for air pollution consistently throughout the years. So this is a slitting machine, again, used for, um, it's used for cutting paper, um, and it's actually not supposed to be used in hot and humid environments. Um, I know all this because I did my research. And um, on the DG3 website, I had this in another slide, but this is a condensed version of the presentation. Um, but on the DG3 website, it says that uh, people dealing with paper uh, uh, splitting specifically are going to be in hot and humid environments. So, you know, it's clear that they are admitting that the conditions that they work in are not the ideal conditions, not only for the workers, but also just for the environment, not only for the environment, but also the workers. Um, these are really dangerous chemicals, and I'll explain this in the next slide, but they should not be without masks. This guy should not be without gloves because, and I'm going to break this down even more, but even if it is an area source of volatile, of hazardous air pollutants, it's still, it's still just as bad given its, you know, mixture with being a major source of VOCs. So VOCs, um, some of the specific, uh, I guess, symptoms of being, you know, in contact with VOCs are eye, nose, and throat irritation, headaches, nosebleeds, fatigue, nausea, allergic reaction, uh, and vision and memory loss. Like I said, uh, they have a strong odor. I guess you can think of like a dumpster or something, and at room temperature, they're co colorless. So very high levels. Think about how people who work there every day experience, you know, major sources of volatile organic compounds. So very high levels can lead to kidney damage, central nervous system, nervous system damage. Um, they use benzene, which is known to cause leukemia, uh, formaldehyde, which causes cancer. They don't use that, but that's an example. Um, TCE uh, causes kidney cancer, chloroform, et cetera. So uh, they are a major source of chemicals that have the possibility to do any one of these things, if not a combination. Um, hazardous air pollutants. There are 188 air toxics or air pollutants. Um, and you know they can contain... Um, Hazardous air pollutants can be one group of pollutants, I believe, or a mixture of them. So also the health effects depend on what's associated with that HAP. Um, you can think of it as, hmm. yeah, it's just a different, every, because there's such a broad range of what the air pollutant can be, there are different health effects that you can have based on one combination or another combination, or even just one, you can have a range of health effects. So the circumstances are also important. The amount of chemicals, the length of time a person is exposed. So for example, if you're doing an eight hour shift at DG3, um, and the, also the stage of life. They're really important uh, for the DEP to be monitoring because they have, uh, they're associated with the increased risk of cancer, developmental effects. And what I think I wanted to highlight the most is heritable gene mutations, right? This means that if, you know, an air pollutant gets you sick, you know, you have the ability to pass it on to your kids to pass it on to their kids, et cetera. And you will then start a heritable uh, gene in your gene mutation in your family, right? Um, so let me move this again. Uh, yeah, another thing is in addition to like breathing it in itself, 
some of them can seep into the soil, right? And eventually it might make it into the food chain. Eventually, you know, that place can't be used if DG3 is knocked down. Um, and animals can also experience health problems, which is important because um, DG3 is right next to Liberty State Park. It's a six minute drive from Liberty State Park. And we're gonna get into that as well. Um, like I said, they emit two tons of halves a year. These are some of them that they release, uh, ethylene glycol, xylene, humine, um, and ethyl benzene. And what I found the most interesting because they haven't like always emitted this, these, these are uh, chemicals that they've emitted since they started uh, as a company, but this only came up a couple years ago, um, which is interesting to me. Mm. So I wanted to tell you all why and what we can do about this and why we're even competing, because what is a problem if their permit is going to be approved anyway? Um, I asked them a question. I said, according to the Clean Air Act, major sources are defined by specific emission thresh thresholds. Where does DG3 fall under this definition? Um, and if they do, what are the steps being taken to minimize the emissions? And then Christian said, uh, DG3 potential emissions exceed major source thresholds for only volatile organic compounds. However, the actual emissions are below the major source thresholds. DG3 is consistently reducing to uh, use low VOC materials, et cetera, et cetera. And the important part is where it says, in addition, DG3 is planning on accepting a lower emission limit that would make them a minor source and not require a major source permit. So what they're essentially saying is they want to go from over 100 tons a year to somehow under that, even though their emissions have always been in violation of what the DEP set for them. And that's why um, we have to be skeptical and also be able to interrogate, um, you know, the facility more. So I want to talk about why area sources are important, even though they're, you know, lesser uh, of the amount of chemicals. So one is cumulative exposure. You know, area sources still release pollutants, right? And that can lead to a cumulative exposure in local populations. So like the air around DG3 in, in combination with the VOC, the major source of VOCs and the area source of HAPS can lead to even more exposure. So, um, you know, even if one of the sources is emitted in small amounts, like I said, the combined impact leads to high levels of exposure um, instead of the same or lower. Uh, like I said, it can persist in not only the air, but the soil. And there's a lot of challenges in regulation and monitoring, right? So regulating can be challenging because they don't necessarily, they cannot, um, they can't, basically they can't watch DG3 all the time. They have some reports they have to make them submit and they can submit it on time or not, but that's as far as they can do in terms of inspection. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So um, emissions from area sources of HAPS can be a health risk and is a health risk, uh, especially because HAPS are known for causing, even in small, relatively small amounts, uh, adverse health effects. Yeah, so the combination itself, uh, can lead to a synerg synergistic uh, health risk for the community. So say if one you know, VOC can give you cancer, right? But then one half can give you, can affect your central nervous system. If those two are interacting with each other, then you have an elevated risk to get either or both. Um, yeah. So again, it affects sensitive populations the most, so children, the elderly, et cetera, and especially those with health conditions uh, that were pre-existing. So, you know, if it's true that people in Jersey City, adults are prone to have asthma, then if they're in this area, 
Jersey City residents will most likely be, you know, negatively impacted by the chemicals. They might be breathing worse, you know, they might be feeling worse because asthma, you know, can affect somebody in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, so this is how I would like you guys to think of it. Being a major source of VOCs and be, while being a minor source uh, or an area source of HAPS is like having a car constantly idling in your driveway and emitting that directly into your surroundings because they're if they're making billions of paper billions of pieces of paper a year these things are constantly being emitted and not only that but the dp sets standards and limits on how long your operation hours can be guess what they did exceeded their operation hours so it's either them, I know, I think the violations are next, uh, they are, but it's either them exceeding emission limits or um, barely making the cut for them. So like I said, these are their, these are Christian's three points. One, potential emissions exceed the major source threshold only for VOCs, like that's supposed to make it any better right? The actual emissions are below the threshold. Like that's supposed to do anything because you submit your reports late. And then DG3 is planning on planning on accepting a lower emission limit that would make them a minor source, right? And with these, I have, you know, I think the community should have three valid questions. Given their violations, how can we be confident that the reported emissions are actually below the thresholds, right? If you're submitting a report that was due five months ago, how can we know that it was accurate in that point of time, point in time? Another one is what measures will be in place to ensure DG3's um, compliance with this lower emissions limit? Because like I said, the DEP can't babysit them, right? They'll only find out after these periodic, you know, um, check-ins with their limits um, or check-ins with the reports that they give in. Um, yeah, how will regu regulatory agencies enforce this? Um, and also one more thing about the lower emission limit, I feel like he's just talking because they've never been even close to under the limit for uh, a major source. So it seems like, and this is something that Doug O'Malley brought up in the um, in the public hearing. It seems like they're trying to, like they they're trying to make a solution out of thin air. He was asking like what quarter of the year this would be done in, and they really had no answer. So this again is kind of evading the question of how are you going to you know fix this harm you did in the community because this answer we don't believe. And then the last one is, how will the community be actively involved in the decision-making process um, and what steps are being taken? Uh, and this is a question that we have because the comment period closes on February 4th and not enough people know about this at the end of the day. Uh, I can say that I have been single-handedly doing all the research, doing all the outreach and I can't inform the whole of Jersey City. So, especially because I found out about this three weeks before the meeting. So this is a question that we have for them um, to push them to engage with us more. After the comment period closes, you can't, they're not accepting any more comments. They won't be heard. Um, so that just means that the comment period needs to be extended um, on this, based on this case, this specific case. Um, so now I want to look into some of their concerning uh, violations. The first one is uh, they ran tests over the maximum rate or they, yeah, they ran tests on their dryer over the maximum rate. They conducted it for from 20% to 60% instead of 10%. The maximum is 10. Um, you submitted your six month deviation report uh what on january 26 that's six months after it was due right oh it was due by july 
2017. So that's still about six months. Um, yeah, they, like I said, they installed a binary in a slitting machine uh, without the operate without an operating permit. Um, yeah, these are just some of them. And you can see on the side, they've either been closed or superseded. I asked the director of environmental justice of that department what superseded meant. And she said it was basically a, a, a fancy word for it was investigated and closed. So she couldn't really tell me the difference between superseded and closed. But another thing I wanted to look at are the dates. Let's see when these things have opened and closed. This one, June 15th, March 6, 2014. It took them five years. This one, March 18th, 2021. March 19th, 2021. It took them one day to do this and four days to do that. And I get it. It takes you one day, maybe. I'm not saying it doesn't take you one day to see if they did or did not file it late. It's a yes or no question. But again, they have 20 violations and this is just like a snapshot. They have like five from that day, five violations. There were multiple about going over emissions um, and there were multiple that were solved the day after. So that raises suspicion, especially because the community didn't get to evaluate any of this information, didn't get to evaluate their violations, didn't get to evaluate how they were operating in Jersey City because it looks like such a you know covert place. Um, and notices were posted like a lot of reasons, which I'm going to get to at the end because I have very exciting news for you all. Um, this this gives me hope. And uh, yeah, I told you, I guess the slides were out of order, but this is a slitting machine. Their career page says their jobs may be done in hot, humid, and noisy environments. And in high temperature, uh, they, it, slitting machines have a greater impact on the environment. So compared with, or coupled with them using in, it in environments it's not supposed to be used in, they didn't even tell the DEP. So, and that's only one of the machines I looked into. Um, I will say this, and this is in reference to the, uh, what I was saying earlier about the conditions of workers, how they're supposed to be wearing gloves, how they're supposed to be having masks on. Um, Candace Perry, the director of the EJ uh, uh, department, she, she personally sent me their public notice. She personally sent me the where they published it because I asked her, I don't see this anywhere. Where can a community member find this? She sent me the notice itself. It was a very small text on a page of NewJersey.com or NJ.com. So I said, how about I just look up DG3? Maybe if I tell people the name, they'll get, they'll see the notice. No notice came up. No notice. But what did come up in the first four of the searches are obituaries for DG3 workers. Now, if we see in the pictures that they officially put out that they're handling or mishandling these chemicals that are, again, like constantly having an exhaust running in your area, we as a community should question why this, why this comes up instead of your notice at the very least you know, especially to have no, no comments on it. So that's something I found weird, especially because this was like simply from trying to find out where they posted it, right? Imagine you as a community member is trying to find out just where the notice is because somebody told you it was on nj.com and you find this instead, right? It raises, you know, suspicion and it also, you know, just decreases decreases people's willingness to engage with them. Like you can't even find the notice and then this is what you find instead. Yeah, so then Liberty State Park. Sorry to go to another topic so quickly, but uh, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about the park specifically in my webinar, um, the parks keeper, I believe. Uh, Ash, not Ash, I'm looking at you, Ash. Uh, Sam Pesson, 
uh, was in my webinar and he said that DG3 was located at the south entrance, around the south entrance. And I guess from here, you can see it's six minutes, but he said it's by the south entrance. So I'm guessing it's somewhere over here, which means it's even closer, right? So it's about six minutes away. And we can talk about how that's something to press them on as well. So not only does VOCs and HAPs create small smog, but they also, because of the smog, limit access to outdoor spaces. Because when the air quality is bad, people just aren't going outside, especially because you know we had uh, that thing with the forest fires in Canada and people are constantly checking their air quality while they're outside or in spaces that you know they plan on going to. Um, there's also a cultural, a cultural and community aspect of this. Uh, environmental pollution just impacts a bunch of things there. If it's constantly, you know, if VOCs are constantly creating a small, a strong odor, um, if people are uncomfortable, you know, being by that entrance, then it means that people aren't going to engage in Liberty at Liberty State Park uh, as much. Um, especially if they knew this information. Um, another thing is Liberty State Park has a summer camp every year. I'm not too sure when it started up, but they have it every year, usually in um, that area. And I think it would be important not only for, um, I guess, the director or Sam Pesson to know, but also the director of that parks program um, because you know, like I said, only two people were in the meeting and I, my justification for all of, you know, the rallying is that more people, uh, more people, people in the community and people higher up should know. All the council people didn't know about this until I told them. Um, S Sustainable Jersey City didn't know about this until I told them. Um, yeah, this, this is a problem that they kind of, uh, I don't want to say kept secret, but definitely not spread out to the community. Uh, yeah, and this is what I mean. So to Jersey, uh, to officials of Jersey City, the council people, the mayor, right? They lack transparency because not only of their, not only because of their incomplete reporting, et cetera, um, they're just not engaging with the officials or with the city council on a level that's meaningful. Uh, they don't know who DG3 is. They don't know the permitting process and how they can engage. And there's also regulatory gaps. Like I said, um, there's only one regulatory body over DG3 right now, but in you know, a case where we get a special condition added to the permit, we can have a green team, right? Made up of sustainable Jersey City and other, you know, groups that want to. Uh, you know, keep track of this facility because it live. It's so close to their uh, environment, or they care about the issue. Because green green teams are made out of up of different stakeholders. But the point is, they could have another a community set of eyes uh, looking out for them. So another thing is to environmental groups, uh, they're avoiding accountability. Right, DG three. You know they don't they haven't engaged with anybody yet and this is important because they told me that they won't uh answer any public comments until the end of the comment period and the administrative order says that you have to answer them within the comment within the public comment period um they're also supposed to be releasing a copy of the uh tape of the public of the public hearing and um they haven't done that yet so definitely avoiding accountability for at least the things they legally have to do. And also we don't, as, as organizers in environmental groups, we can't necessarily see, uh, or a group like Sustainable Jersey City can't necessarily see how their goals align with, you know, in the, the goals of environmental advocacy, they didn't get a chance to ask. Um, so that you know not only hinders collaboration but also just hurts the relationship because even if this is the administrative order now and they have to function under it in five years they have to abide by the ej law and the ej law has a lot more weight in terms of what the community can do 
Um, and they're going to remember when you didn't engage them the last time your permit hearing came up. Uh, and lastly, uh, I to community members in Jersey City, um, there's obviously a communication breakdown. The parks keeper didn't know about DG3 and how close it was to Liberty State Park. Uh, they're very ineffective with their communication because it was only posted on one site. Um, and not only that, uh, they didn't do enough outreach. The first thing is when I asked for the public comment period to be extended, they never posted an updated, uh, I guess, an updated public notice. So nobody knew that the public comment period was still open after December 6th, right? And that becomes a problem because then people don't are deterred from actually giving in or putting in comments. Um, honestly, nobody would know unless I told them, really. It's February 4th. It used to be in January. I'm not too sure. I think it was like the first week of January. And um, I've been trying to get the word out that you can still do it. Um, but I, I don't know past that how many people are submitting comments. Um, I've submitted several myself. Several. Uh, I So he answered seven questions I had the first time, Christian. And I said, you didn't really think about these much. So let me send you a hundred questions because he has to answer all of them. So I sent him a hundred questions and then I figured out exactly what the problem was because the questions were basically asking generally, what does the group do? What does DG3 do? But then I started looking into like the actual statistics and I, you know, I made basically an alternative plan as to how they can lower their emissions and where they went wrong. And um, that's the last thing I sent to the DEP before um, I met with the, uh, uh, before I got in communication with the council members that plan on, you know, supporting the issue. Yes. So I wanted to tell you my progress so far, uh, because I think it's important to, you know, see that this is getting traction. So in December, I met with Council President Waterman. Um, she supports the issue and she definitely was more was interested at the time. I just didn't necessarily know where to use her endorsement yet. Um, I am meeting next week with Councilwoman Prince Array and Councilman Baganio, Baganio. Ash, I actually have to talk to you about that because uh, they're very familiar with Sustainable Jersey City. So uh, and I think it will be helpful to get them there. Over 50 petition signatures today. I am changing that. So I made a email alert to our clean water members and I got like 80 petition signatures at once. So we're up to like 150 and I'm so happy about that. I'm so happy. And then uh, the last thing is I am planning a public comment session where hopefully either online or hybrid, we can all submit comments at the same time, you know, based on our individual concerns or some of the concerns um, I listed, um, you know, just a list of things I can talk about and ask, you know, DG3 to comment on. Um, so yesterday I had a conversation with, um, Councilman Baganio, Baganio, um, his aide, Pam. And Pam uh, actually kind of uh, took my campaign a step further and asked me to write a resolution about it to be presented to um, the presented at a council meeting next week. Um, but the deadline for it was today. I wrote it up yesterday. The deadline was 3 p.m. today, and apparently um, the legal team didn't get time to put it on the agenda for next week's meeting, but um, it'll be there for the February 7th meeting. And I just wanted to show you a little bit of what it says. Um, no, I said, I said that the department can do it on a case-by-case -case basis. DG3 has an obligation to um, support the community in any way they can. Uh, we believe that environmental justice is inseparable from racial justice. Um, and now therefore, and this is what you know, my ask is of the council members now. Um, and this is also what uh, either council president Waterman or council, uh, councilman Bichanio 
would uh, choose to sponsor. And I can show you or link the whole thing, but essentially it demands the DEP to extend the comment period. So organizations, uh, organizations, residents and relevant authorities can engage and calls for a second public meeting. It's like outrageous that only two people showed up and nobody, none of, not any of them, any two of them were from Jersey City. Right, so that's justification for a next, another public meeting, because this law is honestly really fluid, right? It says that they, they have to engage in meaningful public participation. So what is meaningful? That's kind of what we're critiquing now. We're saying that if you're trying to make a meaningful, you know, engagement with the community, what you've done so far is not that, and you need to start over, starting with an extension of the comment period and having your council member there. Yes, Ash. So just wanted to point you to the time. We're almost oh. at 8.30. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm actually done. <laughs> good. Actually done. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thank you. Um, These are several ways you can participate. So again, submitting your com public comment, uh, signing our petition, which is that QR code, and I can also sign it uh, or send it to you. Showing up and showing out, so maybe reposting events if you can't go to them, um, public meetings, webinars, and then just think about specific asks for the community. What do you think, even if you're not a resident, if DG3 was in your community, what would you ask of them? Um, and that's it. Thank you. Do you? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Do you have a place where the people here can sign your petition online? Yes, I do. I can give you that link now. And also, um, it's over here. Hold on. I, I have to stop. I can send you. So I also have some social media posts. If you guys choose to post it, you can tag Clean Water in it. I, this I is think I can is. post it right now. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to let me put this folder in the chat. Yeah, there are a bunch of ones I made. Uh, you know, hopefully getting it out more will help. Uh because the real point is that the more the louder our voices are and the more voices there are, the more likely the DP is to listen to us. Um so yeah, getting everyone you can to sign it would be great. That's the folder for uh the social media posts. Uh can you guys see this, the resolution? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, this is the full resolution. This is what I drafted. Um, it tells basically a story of what happened and hopefully you guys can come to the public meeting or see it um, because I do think it's a very strong argument. Uh, and yeah, you guys can read it if you want. I'll share that as well. Mm. This and there was one more thing, the petition. I have a quick question. Is the public meeting um, just in person or do they offer like a Zoom option? I'm not too sure. I've never went to Jersey City public meetings or are you talking about, you're not talking about, are you talking about DG3? Yeah. Um, It was virtual last time. Oh, okay. it, it was all virtual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we might ask for like a hybrid session, but like that's if we get the DP to listen first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's about all the resources I have. Thanks. This was amazing. Um, thank you so much. I wanted to ask, like, if we submit a public comment, what are like the heavy hitters to include? I guess. You know what. I can show you, um, but I guess off the top of my head, it would be like, uh, how do you plan on lowering your emission standards if it's true that you have 20 violations and you've mm -hmm. always, and most of them are for exceeding on a daily basis, right? These these are, mm -hmm. yearly, some of them are yearly rates, but some of them are like, you exceeded these many, you know, these many chemicals in this way per minute, right? So getting into the technicalities, because honestly, they don't know. They don't mm -hmm. know as much as about themselves. Like, honestly, I was at the meeting and I was asking him questions, Christian. He's like, I didn't know they had violations. I just got here in 2019. I said, well, they've had seven violations since 2019. You didn't know that? <laughs> 
They don't know. They really don't. So just pressing them on any like technicality would be important. Like for example, you can even ask them, like I, I did very deep research. So I don't know if you know about the Wayback Machine, but the Wayback Machine, Oh, yeah. yes, it's basically a, a, a page where you can see a website, website since its creation at any point in time, right? So I went to the DG3 page and I went to 2012. They had a green team. They had a green team and they had an environmental charter. What happened to it? Right? We can press them on that. Like stuff, stuff they wouldn't know about, stuff they think that we wouldn't care about, you know? Mm hmm Yeah. Thank you for that question, by the way, because I'm actually, I've been thinking about like what to what list of things I can give people to ask. And um mm -hmm. those would be really good. Cool. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Have there been any articles in, in newspapers about this locally? No, not yet. I I've actually, oh, what'd you I, say? Yeah, I would just think that if people read about this, they would just be appalled. And and um, so I was just wondering about contacting, you know, newspapers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Have, have you been in touch with the uh, Jersey Journal or the uh, Jersey City Times? Yeah, I actually just reached out to them very recently, I think at the beginning of the week. But myself, I'm putting a blog out about it. We we post blogs on the Clean Water website. And hopefully, if you guys have any connections with the media, um, I would love that. Because I think, like, once people, you're right, once people know about it, yeah. they're upset. But it's hard well, to- Well, and also, see. like, places like, you know, like on Facebook, there's probably a Liberty State Park page yes. right and people that care about park which are many would see i mean it just seems like to me it seems that people should really know i mean this is like astounding and disturbing and people X, should X, know. what is what is your email address yeah i can put it in the chat it's just it's my name x breakway at cleanwater.org but i'll put it yeah, I I definitely agree. And honestly, that's the way they kind of want it to be, right? That people don't know about it. Um, like you should see the nj.com publication. Like it's like, it's literally a news, it's in the form of a news column. It's like the, the font size is like 0.5, you know, like that, that nobody can see that and it's buried between other publications too so like the only place where they posted it i bet you i was the only viewer me and candace perry who, who Thank is you, candace Ames. perry again candace is the director of the environmental justice department of the dp Okay. And I asked her, I asked her where the notice was, and she got back to me three days later and sent me a link to it. So I guess it was just me and her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very fishy. It's very fishy, especially if you know all the intricacies. I can tell you guys a lot of stuff, but I only had an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, Jersey it's City itself really well has an. Jersey City itself has an illustrious history of <laughs> being a place where there's like a, a dumping ground. So it's kind of ironic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and also the fact that like, it's not just limited to that place because I asked them how they get, the, how are these stuff emitted? Are these things like disposed of? And they said they took it, they take it to a sludge facility somewhere else in Jersey City. Right, so they're very. contributing to that now. So, yeah, it's it's very it's very shocking. I was shocked when I saw it. Yeah, but thank you guys for having me and letting me drone on. <laughs> no, it was very informative. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So, X, I'm emailing uh, you with, with some media contacts and. Oh. Uh, David and Ash, did you mention the DEP uh, environmental series that I mentioned to, to you in an it's email? Posted in the, it's posted in the uh, chat. Oh, great. Okay. And Thank reminding you. people that you can you can click on a button and get the chat saved.
Mm. So you oh, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. That is really helpful. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that would be perfect because this is such an intricate issue to explain. Like, honestly, my I've been getting better outreach, keeping it as minimal as possible than giving them all the information because people don't want to see that. Like I, I labeled the council emails as urgent health issue in Jersey City. That's all they need to know because I emailed them about DG3 two months ago. They didn't have any response, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I don't want to hold you guys up too much. I know it's past time. Um, yeah. And do you mind if really? I have a copy of the recording, please, Ash? Yeah, sure. We, we'll get it to you. I think uh, not a problem. Go ahead, David. Yeah, are there any more questions? If not, I want I want to thank you. Actually, you did a uh, for the fabulous presentation, and and wish you the very best in your work. And hopefully, people will contact you with any other questions they have and yes. sign the petition, etc. Yes, feel free to contact me for anything else about DG three because I I. I can just transport it to somebody else now. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. And I hope to see you guys in future meetings. And yeah, absolutely. Keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Bye now.